Hi there, it's Laura Tobin here. I'm really sorry that I can't be with you in person. I am in Austria. I am in Innsbruck. The beautiful Alps are here behind me and I'm here for a very special reason, for an international weather summit. I can give you a behind the scenes of what's going on here. There are 30 presenters from 20 different nations and we come together every year, usually it's been cancelled three for three years now because of the pandemic, to talk about weather, talk about climate change and actually here in the Alps the impacts of climate change are pretty profound and one thing that will happen, I'm certain because of me being here, people will say you have flown to talk about climate change. How can you fly and put a footprint on the planet and then talk about climate change. And actually that's a big topic that people discuss and for us it's really important for me to be here in person to see the impacts of climate change. It's also really important for me to meet the other weather presenters, to share what we know, to share our love and our passion and when we have extreme weather we each tell each other country what's going on. For example there's severe weather in Greece and our Greek counterpart here has been telling us all the information about what's going on and we can share that and I think that's a big thing with climate change, thinking about your footprint, thinking about what's important and why we need to share that with others and making an impact but the right impact. Um, so yes, I'm here and the one thing that we found out about Innsbruck is that temperatures have warmed by around about two degrees Celsius and in the Alp region that has a big impact on the snow season and the ski season. Snow has reduced and it means that the ski season shrinks. It means that places like here and around the Alps need to change the tourism that they have. The activities need to be more pr prolonged in the summertime, particularly into September where they may usually have had their first snowfall a long time ago. It affects the hydropower, it affects water resources. Millions of people in the Alps rely on the weather and the snow here. I also did a trip a while ago to Svalbard in the high Arctic and actually was really eye-opening. I thought I knew about the science of climate change. I spoke to the Met Office who did a cryosphere report looking at the impacts of any frozen parts of our planet and actually I went there in person and found that my eyes were open to the reality of climate change. I think that's a big thing in education, not just to talk about the science and put up graphs but also show the impacts and why it matters so much. So we went to Svalbard and we know that the Arctic is warming more than anywhere else on planet Earth, two to three times faster. But Svalbard was warming nearly six times faster than the rest of the world and the impacts were profound on what I could see visually. First of all we went to see a glacier, I went with a guy who had been there 40 years before and I was 40 when I was basically travelling there and he said if you look up the mountain range about half a mile you will see where the glacier ends and we were standing where it ended 40 years ago so in 40 years I could visibly see the retreat up the, up the glacier up the hill but then also he said to me look 10 metres above your head the volume of ice was 10 meters high all the way up the hill and I suddenly then had this real understanding of how much ice is physically being lost out into the seas and the oceans and that was just one glacier or one part of Svalbard in one part of the Arctic and that is happening absolutely everywhere and if every single glacier on earth melted it would contribute to around about half a meter of sea level rise by the end of the century. Half a meter may not sound very much but that would be enough to put parts of Peterborough, Leeds, Kent all around the wash underwater and that's one thing that's really important for us to be able to communicate in climate change what happens further afield actually impacts us in the UK. The other thing we found out was the impact on actually the people there and the tourism. Again, they had a huge reduction in the amount of snow, a huge reduction in the ski season. They had a place called the Ice Fjord that actually used to be ice. It hasn't frozen over in the summer for a long, long, long time, but it always froze over in the winter until 2017. And we met a guy from the tourism industry who took people out on snowmobiles. And he said in 2017, he had to phone everybody in the winter season and say there is no ice to go on the ice fjord. You can come, but there are no activities for you to come. And he lost all of his tourism that year and he had to then come up with new ideas for the coming seasons to, because of the impact of climate change so it completely affected him. We also found out about the wildlife, we found that the waters around the Arctic are Arctic waters but there's a thing happening called Atlantification so the warmer waters from the Atlantic are moving their way northwards as they do so it interacts with the Arctic waters so rather than there being Arctic fish for the polar bears to eat, they're Atlantic fish and they have very different properties, they're not as nutritious for them so the polar bears are now swimming further to get the food that they need. The further they swim, the more tired they become, the more they need to eat and we're finding the polar bear population is significantly dwindling. Also they're having more rain than snow and when it's much much milder the rain falls and at night time it freezes and it's having a really bad, bad impact for the reindeer there. The population of reindeer can shuffle through the snow to get to the grass to get to the food but when it rains and freezes it turns to ice and they have to break through the ice with their hooves 
And when they, do, when they can't do that and because of that, reindeer populations are dying because they are starting to starve. So these are some of the real life things that we saw with climate change up in the Arctic. And again, people complained that we went there, but we went there because I wanted to see in real life and feel in my heart the impacts of climate change. And I think progressively, I've been reporting on more and more severe weather in the 18 years I've been a weather forecaster, more frequent, more often, it's happening closer to home. We saw last summer in uh, Germany, huge floods. We had record rainfall totals, causing billions of pounds worth of damage. We had record rainfall in China, where the subway is completely flooded. In Canada, we saw temperatures of nearly 50 degrees Celsius in a town called Lytton, which was the highest temperature Canada has ever recorded. And the very next day, it was so hot, there was wildfires, and it burnt down 90% of the town. Climate scientists have done a study to see how likely that would be to happen. Some people will say, but these extremes, they just happen. This is just nature. Scientists found that the chances of that happening in a natural world was once in every 150,000 years. But because the Earth has warmed already by 1.2 degrees Celsius since pre-industrial times, the chances of that happening now will be once in every 1,000 years. And by the end of the century, it would happen every other year. So the impacts of climate change are becoming more frequent, more severe, impacting more people, and they slowly but surely will feel those impacts closer to home. So I know one thing talking about climate change in education, particularly to young people, is not wanting there to be climate anxiety. I think we have to tell the real story and have to show the true story, but also show positive stories, the things that people are doing to make a difference, the things people are doing to make a change. And there is a huge amount of change happening from the top down and from the bottom up. And I think this is where it's really important that we can lead by example whether you want to put in better recycling at your school, whether you want to have compost, whether you want to have your own allotment. My school recently did the plastic counts and we all counted our plastic and those letters went to the government and the government will know how much plastic there is. There are so many great things that you can do. So that's why I'm really excited to be part of the Climate Ambassador Scheme because there are so many people like me who know so much about the weather and climate and have seen it and experienced and know the science and want to help to communicate it in a way that's really easy to understand. So you can have people like me come to your school and talk to the children we can come and talk to you as teachers about the best resources and the game, getting the best information from the correct sources so that you get everything you need to know from the most credible sources and not get them from places that perhaps may skew the information one way or the other whether you want to become a greener school there are definitely people we could put you in touch with so just really excited to let you know how passionate I am. I went to COP26 in Glasgow and there was a real drive that science was behind everything, trying to meet this 1.5 degree target, trying to limit our warming to that. And every single country committed to reduce their emissions to net zero, lots of them by 2050. I think around about 65% of the population of Earth are now under a net zero commitment by 2050, which is fantastic. And now we know as scientists that if everybody kept to their commitment, we by the end of the century could limit our warming by 1.8 degrees Celsius. So we're not quite there with the 1.5, but we are very, very close. And because of that, we know that the next time when the top 27 happens later this year in Egypt, there's a very good chance we could get much closer to that. So I think the positive to tell children and for you to know is that everybody keeping their commitments, everybody coming up with new technologies and working together means that it certainly could be possible. But now is the time to educate young people who can educate their parents to just say why it's so important. Um, I have a couple of questions that were sent to me, um, so I just will answer those now. One is, how would you suggest that we enthuse children about meteorology? Uh, well, I fell in love with weather because my geography teacher taught us about the jet stream. So the jet stream is a fast moving ribbon of air high up in the atmosphere that drives weather systems to our shores and it brings us wind and rain, often in the spring and in the autumn. It moves to our north in the summer and we're warm and it moves to our south in the winter and it makes us cool. And he wanted to show us how it worked in a really visual way. He lined the kids up in the classroom and he lined the girls up in a straight line and he lined the boys up in a straight line. We were the warm air, they were the cold air and he said I want you to run across the classroom pushing into each other and see what happens when you get to the other side. And by the time we got to the other side we were a wiggly line and he said that is how the jet stream works. It's just warm air pushing into cold air and it creates a ripple. And at that stage, at 14, I've flown the Met Office to say, how do I become a weather forecaster? I did A-level maths and physics. I went to university and did physics and meteorology. And the rest is history. So I was very fortunate that just something very visionary, something really, really fun 
was what got me into meteorology. Uh, another question is, why is green energy solutions still not seen as an important way to help the climate? Um, it is, and we actually are leading the way. We are very good in the UK with our offshore wind. We have the largest offshore wind farm in the entire world. There are huge plans to extend, expand that. In a world where we are going to be greener with more electricity, we need to electrify our grid by fourfold. There are huge plans to have onshore and offshore wind turbines and also solar energy. You know, Earth has given us everything we need for free to help to power it, but putting the infrastructure in in the first place takes a lot of effort. But we are definitely leading the way and there'll be much more of that. And with what's been happening in Russia, with the way that they hold so much fossil, fossil fuels for energy across Europe, luckily we don't really rely on very much of that. But I think that that is the way forward. Um, so there are lots of solutions and there are lots of people like me who want to help to spread the word. So I hope you have a wonderful day. I hope you have a wonderful event and I hope I'll be seeing some of you soon.